Hello, hello, and welcome to Talking All Things Cardiopalm. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Barisi. As you can see, if you're on YouTube, uh, it is a warm day in Kansas City um, in a tank top. I've been outside gardening and kind of getting my yard together, have another project going. If you guys follow me, uh, you know that my wife and I are constantly in DIY mode, and right now we're tackling the backyard. So last summer, we actually had an overhead structure place with uh, extension of our patio because we had like this four by four slab that a small table couldn't even fit on. And we desperately needed some shade because, well, my wife is uh, ginger. So I like to keep her covered, like to have some shade options. And it was quite the project. In the process of all that, our yard got completely wrecked. So our grass was finally all grown in and was just like looking plush. And now we're basically starting over. So um, really just been in spring cleaning mode and wanting to get my garden going. Uh, since we've moved to Kansas City, I think the last five years, I haven't been able to get my garden in the ground. And again, if you guys know me, um, I have a pretty robust garden throughout the summer. I was raised having a garden. It's very cultural for me. And there just truly isn't anything better than having your hands in the soil and, and actually having um, fresh vegetables that taste the way they're supposed to taste. So my goal is to get the garden in and I just have this like overwhelming desire to be in the garden, which I've just been uh, doing because at this point I'm wasting time thinking about doing work or doing the garden. So I, we're, we're just going for it. With that being said, while I have been shoveling endless amounts of dirt, I couldn't stop thinking about a patient I had over the weekend who I really just thought was the perfect case study to describe a diagnosis. And so I had this patient um, with pericarditis, so 69-year-old female with recent admission to an outside hospital due to shortness of breath and chest pain, found out to have pericarditis. Um, she was eventually transferred to our hospital and a PT consult was placed. So I think this is an important topic to talk about for a couple of reasons. Number one, just understanding a diagnosis helps you to treat that patient more efficiently. It also allows you to know if it's safe to proceed. And I think in the acute care setting, sometimes that's the most important question to ask. Is this patient ready for me to intervene? And as a profession that is literally mobilizing and exercising these patients, when we have issues with the heart, we have to literally ask the question, is this safe? So I'm going to talk about pericarditis. And I'm going to continue to parallel a little bit with my patient just because I thought it was just this perfect case, just a built-in case that was really clear cut and can walk us through this diagnosis. So number one, pericard pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium. Pericardium is the layer that surrounds the heart and its role is really protective in nature. It is attached to the diaphragm. Um, it protects against any other organs that may be nearby. And it's a two layer um, system. So there is always fluid in the pericardial sac. That is normal, something around 20 milliliters, some texts say 50, but essentially there's a small amount of fluid in the pericardial sac at all times because its role is to help prevent friction when there's contraction. That's its purpose. And the outer layer is outer layers a bit more fibrous, so it's protective in nature. And also to note that the coronary arteries pass through the pericardium before it hits the myocardium. So essentially pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium. And in many cases, this inflammation progresses to an effusion. So now an effusion basically means we have fluid, but we've already said there's always fluid in this space. We have more fluid, extra fluid. And now if we're thinking about this tight, small layer that's surrounding the heart, if we have an effusion within this sac essentially what happens is the fluid starts causing pressure on the heart. So if we have a small pericardial effusion, sometimes it's just treated medically with um, medication. But 
in severe situations, when that fluid becomes restrictive on the heart, we call that cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is a medical emergency. So if you were to get this consult where the 69 year old female has been transported from an outside hospital with known pericarditis, known pericardial effusion, known cardiac tamponade, and they just arrived, this is not the patient you're going to evaluate in this moment. This patient is not ready for you. So basically, we end up with um, decreased cardiac output because the fluid is literally constricting the heart itself. Okay. In very severe cases, it can lead to fluid backup. Patient ends up with bilateral lower extremity edema. But in many cases, patients' typical symptoms or signs is essentially shortness of breath and chest pain. Now, this is one of those differential pieces that we tend to think about, right? So is it angina or is it non-anginal chest pain? Is it non-ischemic chest pain? Pericarditis is, I want to say, one of the easier ones to tease out because they have some very distinguishable signs related to the pain. So number one, it tends to be very sharp. The chest pain is sharp and it tends to worsen with deep breathing and it might worsen with change in position. For instance, laying on your back, laying on the left side, and they tend to have sharp pain right in the front of the chest. So the front of the chest doesn't help you differentially diagnose, right? Because angina can be substernal. But I had a few key words in there to think about. Number one is sharp. Number two, it worsens with deep breathing. That is not a normal anginal sign because angina is reproduced with oxygen demand, with exercise. Breathing shouldn't affect angina. Breathing will make pericarditis, pericardial effusions worse. And so if you think about the anatomy, the pericardium attaches to the diaphragm. So if you have this effusion in that pericardial sac and we take a deep breath, it's pulling on that layer that is inflamed and fluid filled and is going to cause more restriction in some sort of way, which can enhance pain. So deep breathing is one of those signs that helps differentiate between angina. Change in position is the other big one. Angina does not get worse or better with change in position. It solely gets better with rest, decrease in O2 demand. Pericarditis will get worse in certain positions. So laying flat on the back, potentially laying on the left side, because the heart is going to be pressing against the chest wall in the left side lying. Key, they will have decreased pain in a forward leaning position. So if the patient leans forward, it's gonna give them relief of their chest pain. So positional change can make pericarditis better or worse. That is not typical of angina. It can also cause radiation of pain to the shoulders. That doesn't help us because we know angina can do that. Fatigue, anxiety. If patients might develop fever, that's a little bit of a differential um, and shortness of breath is big. So shortness of breath, worsening pain with deep breathing, change in position can make the chest pain better or worse. But the big one is leaning forward improves the pain. So hold that one in there because that was something that was not taught to my patient. So what causes pericarditis or pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade, the list is very long. So first of all, it could be idiopathic, meaning we don't know the cause, but the most common cause of pericarditis is infection. So my patient had a recent pneumonia admission, and that could be a lingering symptom. She also had increased white blood cells. So infection tends to be a key trigger to pericarditis. 
we know that in the last three years, pericarditis increased in, in the world of COVID. COVID was an increased risk for pericarditis. Um, Post-cardiac procedures is another common cause. So for instance, if you had um, open heart surgery and you had a cabbage performed, they're cutting into the heart. And so sometimes post-procedure, they can end up with a pericardial effusion. Hopefully it can be managed medically and doesn't turn into cardiac tamponade, but it can. Same for heart attack. Heart attack can cause pericardial effusion. Um, trauma, metabolic disorders like kidney failure, cancer, especially uh, metastasized cancer, autoimmune diseases, the list is pretty long. Oh, drugs and toxins. So certain medications can also cause pericarditis. And we also know that um, with the vaccine, we were seeing some increase in pericarditis in young, healthy males. So there are a number of different possibilities that can cause pericarditis. In this picture, my patient had known pneumonia. So that seemed to be the higher possibility compared to like autoimmune disease, which they were looking into. So with cardiac tamponade, primary symptom, shortness of breath, chest pain, maybe the feeling of fatigue or weakness. And then they're going to have some pretty obvious um, tests and measures or di diagnostic tests. So number one, you might hear on auscultation, a pericardial friction rub. You're going to hear this rub. It's kind of like um, a raspy grating sound. Basically, the heart layers are inflamed and rubbing with contraction. Some people um, say it can be difficult to hear, better heard on expiration, or um, if the patient is holding their breath, you might get a better um, audible for that. It can also kind of disappear. So if you're auscultating, you may or may not hear it. So it's important to auscultate frequently and also trial different positions. Most commonly patients um, are best heard in the left sideline position. Again, this is a very common position to hear abnormal heart sounds like S3 and S4 as well, because in left side lying, the heart is pressing against the chest wall. So you're getting the heart as close to the chest wall as possible, which makes it easier from an auditory perspective. You might have um, changes on ECG. So this was a new one for me um, because I didn't know what this looked like from an uh, ECG perspective, but with pericarditis, you might have ST elevation. So then the question is, okay, that is typically a sign of ischemia or infarction. So what's the, the difference? Apparently the ST elevation is very specific. So it looks different and has a concave up ST elevation versus a concave down. I personally cannot distinguish the difference between this, but now I'm going to dive in a little bit because, Hey, that seems like a very interesting difference. And they tend to have a reciprocal depression in lead AVR. And so that's very specific and seems to be an always. There tends to be an ST depression in AVR as well as PR elevation. So AVR is always picked versus in ischemic disease, typically you have two or three leads that are consecutive that show ST elevation changes. So I thought that was super interesting. They also have a change in their ECG over time as that pericarditis sort of works itself out. And so the ST changes will disappear. Eventually they'll end up with a T wave inversion and then eventually it's back to all clear. While in infarction, if a patient has a true infarction, ST elevation, ST, let me say that again, a STEMI, they will end up with a Q wave, which is basically a stamp on that ECG forever stating that they had an MI. So just some interesting differences to help with differential diagnosis. Again, as a PT, this isn't what you're doing in the world of diagnosing, but I think it's really interesting or important to be able to recognize it in the chart where you're reading the chart and you have these known findings and you can just kind of click through those check marks. Yep, we know this is going to happen. Yes, this is expected. On chest x-ray, you might see an enlarged heart. Um, 
but not as it's not as specific as a TTE. So a TTE is a transthoracic echo. Essentially, it's essentially it's an ultrasound of the chest wall, and that tends to be the most specific finding for pericardial effusion. On labs, they will have an increased CRP and ESR, which are basically inflammatory markers. My patient had increased both. So things that you are expecting to see and then seeing it, right? It gives you the clear picture that this is the expectation. From a treatment perspective, it depends on the severity of the pericarditis, if it progresses to pericardial effusion, if there is known cardiac tamponade. In some situations, they just treat via medication and they typically use NSAIDs. So they're using anti-inflammatory medications to basically resolve this inflammatory process. I learned another new med during this episode, and that is a medication called colchicine. And colchicine is actually an anti-inflammatory med that is typically used for gout, but is has an off-label use very commonly for acute pericarditis. So again, you see it in the chart. It's this clear picture compared to the diagnosis. And it just was this like wonderful mirroring of, hey, I'm expecting to see this. If the pericardial effusion is significant, if there is known cardiac tamponade where there's literal change in cardiac output because of the pressure being placed on the heart, then likely they're going to remove the fluid. And they do that with a procedure called pericardiocentesis. And pericardiocentesis is essentially a needle aspiration. So they place a needle into the pericardium. It's typically guided via, via ultrasound or chest, chest X-ray fluoroscopy type imaging so they can see and be precise. And then they aspirate said fluid. What they typically do in this patient population is add a pericardial drain at the same time. And I think this is a wonderful plan because it eliminates the amount of times they have to go back in and come back out because that's going to increase the risk of infection and potential scarring. And we know that if we have scarring of the heart, it's going to cause changes in contraction. So pericardial drain essentially allows them to make this one puncture, allow the drain to be present, exit the body, and allow any excess fluid to eliminate over time instead of having to go for another pericardiocentesis. This is important again. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. This is important again because as the PT going into this room, I now know that the patient has been treated. So she had cardiac tamponade. She had potential decrease in cardiac output. She was in a medically emergent situation, which I am not treating during that time. But now I know that she is post pericardiocentesis. She has an active pericardial drain, which had minimal drainage. So it seems to be controlled and she's on appropriate medication to help control said inflammation. That's a green light for me, right? But I understand this concept. I understand this process. So when I go in to see this patient, I am 100% going in, assessing vitals, assessing chest wall mobility, assessing breathing patterns. And I didn't have to do much when I walked into the room to know that this patient was still short of breath. So I was actually surprised when I walked into the room, the patient was in flat supine. I mean, like flat. And for the most part in the hospital setting, you almost never see anyone with the bed completely flat. Like when you're trying to assess bed mobility, you have to do the whole, like we need to put the bed all the way down to assess what you have at home. And she was actively short of breath. She had a one-to-one -one ratio, very shallow breathing. She looked uncomfortable. So the first question I asked her was, do you have relief when you sit up? And she's like, I don't really think so. I don't think it's much different. I was just really surprised that she was in the supine position. So we did a little bit of talking and warm up in that position, but got her into the edge of the bed pretty quickly. So I assessed her vitals in the supine position. Her heart rate was like 105, 108, kind of teetering on that 110 marker. Like I said, one-to-one -one IE ratio on the breathing. And as soon as we sat up, her heart rate calmed down. She like dropped low 100s, high 90s. 
We started talking about breathing. We talked about a whole bunch of other things. She still seemed pretty uncomfortable. And then I just asked her, have you tried leaning forward? And she said, no. So I said, all right, well, let's give it a try. We put her in a, I put her in a tripod position, just elbows on knees, leaning forward. We were already talking about breathing. And she just automatically calmed down. I didn't do anything extraordinary, but my knowledge of pericarditis, knowing that they get relief in the forward lean position was worth a try in the situation. And it was the first time she had true relief in any position. So the reason why it's important to understand different pathology is because when you know what you're working with, you can better accommodate your patient. You can teach them things to maximize their potential. So she, um, we ended up doing our normal session. She needed to use the bathroom. We did interval walking and we didn't do much. We probably did 10 feet to the bathroom plus 20 feet. We took a rest break and then one more 10 foot bout. And she had a drop in blood pressure on that last drop on that last interval. So that short bout of 10, 20, 10 was just too much for her. But with that being said, her symptoms were improved because we were now pacing our breath. We were performing purse slip breathing with just concentrating on extending exhale. I wasn't pushing the increased inhale because that would further the diaphragm movement inferiorly, but just to extend the exhale to slow down the rate was a game changer for her. Got her out of the bed, set up the table so she could lean in tripod position, and it was a successful session. So just to break that down, we did breathing with concentrate, concentration on extending exhalation. I actually did lateral costal breathing with her just to concentrate on expanding lower ribs because she did have bilateral pleural effusions but I didn't push the IE ratio to be big. We actually started just with a one to two ratio. She was able to get to close to a two to four is probably 1.5 to like three ish. And she started incorporating breathing while she was ambulating versus rushing each time she had to get up because she knew she was going to be short of breath and she just wanted to get there. And then the big game changer for her was positioning. Just learning to lean forward gave her relief. And now she can utilize that tool anytime she gets short of breath. And then interval training, right? Short bouts, monitoring vitals, monitoring response. And then once she had that drop, that was quit point. So then you can progress from that piece. So the one piece I didn't say about pericardial effusions, and this is kind of common with many of the effusion processes in the body, is that they tend to be recurrent. So 30% of patients, and that range is somewhere between 15 to 30% of patients with pericarditis will have recurrent pericardial effusion. So the recurrence is always an issue because now we're going to have prolonged inflammation, potential scarring, which will then cause long-term effects. But in this situation, if the current treatment fixes the issue, they find the underlying problem, they treat the underlying problem, then likely she will just continue as she was previously. Um, anything else? So that was a big picture. So just recap, pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardial space, can progress to effusion of the pericardial sac, which can cause cardiac tamponade, which is a medical emergency because it places pressure on the heart, basically restricting its movement and cardiac output eventually. These patients are typically treated with medication like anti-inflammatories, potential pericarditis, uh, pericardiocentesis, and pericardial drain. It's important to make sure that the patient is being managed before treating this patient. And most importantly, please monitor vitals. If that blood pressure is tanking, if the heart rate is increasing, that's enough to pull back. But if you don't take those parameters, you don't know if 
the tolerance is there, minus obviously the shortness of breath that may or may not be getting worse. And then of course, position change is the key with pericarditis. If chest pain or shortness of breath is worsening in certain positions and getting better in others, that is a differential diagnosis for angina. All right. I think that is all that I have for you today. If you have any questions, please reach out to me on the Instagrams at all things cardio palm. And you can shoot me a text, which I will throw in my show notes because I never remember it off the top of my head. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Whatever you have to do, get after it. <laughs>